Okay. Um, many of the themes I'm going to talk about are strikingly familiar <laughs> um, because of what's going on in Tunisia now is really sort of going on on a global uh, level. And Frank has written about this and, and you know, the, the challenge of populism and, and the, the question of, uh, of political fragmentation, alienation, polarization, all these themes that we are all concerned about now, which hit home in so many ways are part of the Tunisian landscape. And what I'm going to do is provide a kind of analytical or conceptual sort of way of thinking about this. I'm not going to get too much in the detail, but I have put up. This is something a friend of mine put up on Facebook. I think the, the results may not be quite accurate, but I think they'll be close, and we'll talk a little bit about this. I'm not going to get a lot too much in the weeds, because I'd like to talk really about how to think about Tunisia in a comparative perspective and sort of how to think about the problem uh, of uh, a challenge of democratic consolidation. Now, I led a group of uh, 12 of our students to Tunis in June as a part of a course on problems of consolidation and deconsolidation that I'm teaching at Georgetown. And we went to Tunis to, in June as a kind of case study uh, to look at what was, what was going on. And uh, you know, I think the good news here is that we don't really study democratic consolidation much anymore. <laughs> We're, we're concerned about deconsolidation, backsliding, there are a hundred metaphors for it. And suddenly I had to dive into a literature which I hadn't looked at in, in, in years. Um, because here in the Arab world where we've had a process of re or uh, authoritarian upgrading as Steve Heidemann calls it, or, or, uh, or, or, or increased authoritarian centralization in, in what used to be uh, systems that I called liberalized autocracies. We don't have examples of consolidation. Tunisia is the only case in the Arab world in the wake of the 2011 uh, political revolts where you had a transition to competitive democracy. And that is something well worth uh, remembering uh, because uh, it was a singular achievement. And when you consider what's going on in the neighbor countries, Algeria, Libya, which is a collapsed state, Sisi in Egypt, uh, the wider region, uh, little Tunisia really accomplished quite a quite a feat, um, and um, I have written quite a bit about sort of the initial uh, and published a number of articles about the initial uh, years of this transition. And I want to, by way of putting out this sort of framework to think about Tunisia, I want to start by distinguishing between the, the whole process of uh, a transition and the wider problem of democratic consolidation. Tunisia is, as political scientists, I think, would call it a divided society in which there are very deep ideological and social, geographic cleavages. Among others, you have the Islamist secular cleavage, which is, in some respects, almost an existential kind of cleavage in uh, Tunisia, although my, some of my Tunisian colleagues would say that's an exaggeration, but it's very deep. And in the context of, a, 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 of this kind of transition, uh, Tunis had a successful uh, transition that was, went through a process of being pacted or a no negotiated. It was a pacted transition. Uh, and in a classic case of pacted transitions, really, despite the fact that Tunisians refer to what happened in Tunis as a revolution, there was not a revolution. It was never a revolution. It was a negotiated agreement. Uh, between different forces, particularly in 2014, that allowed for the reintegration of elements of the Ancien Regime into the political arena, business leaders, political leaders, uh, reflected in the, uh, 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 the former president who passed away just recently, mm -hmm. um, and the party, Nida Tunis, that he represented. This was a party that really represented a lot of the elements from the old regime. And it was to the credit of uh, Anakta's leader, Hanushi, that he understood from the very beginning, or at least he came to understand, maybe not from the very beginning, but he certainly came to appreciate the need, basically, to uh, come uh, to an agreement and, uh, and, uh, and agree to various concessions that were meant to diffuse the fears and concerns of, uh, of the secular groups uh, and the business groups. Um, Tunisia, thank God, does not have a, 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 a politicized military like we have in Egypt. And therefore, after, uh, after the revolution, uh, and Ben Ali fled, the late Ben Ali now fled to Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, the two sides in this struggle, and that's a highly simplified way of summarizing this struggle, uh, 
uh, had two choices, as I wrote in the Journal of Democracy, among other places, and that is to fight or to talk. <laughs> there was no third party that was going to arbitrate or pretend to arbitrate their differences. They had to talk to one another or fight one another, but there was nowhere else to go. So they ended up, as many of you know, deciding to talk and negotiate. Uh, and this led to a, what was called the National Dialogue. A pact-making process led by the UGTT, the large trade union in a country of 11 million people. UGTT has maybe 600,000 members. That's quite remarkable when you think about it. And they really arbitrated this agreement, along with a number of other groups. <coughs> Uh, and they received for this effort the Nobel Prize. It was quite an accomplishment. And this pact really produced a series of compromises and set the stage for the creation of a constitution which was meant to uh, focus on the need for compromise and the need for consensus. Um, and, and so w the transition gave birth to a consensus-based government. And this reflected deeper structural forces in Tunisian history, which are, which are important to recognize because as a result of patterns of economic and social development that go back at least to the 60s, you had the emergence of an urban, educated uh, middle class and a significant constituency that favored some form of secularism. And so when elections first took place in Tunisia for the Constituent Assembly in 2012, I guess it was, and the Constituent Assembly was a body that was created just to write a constitution, although it ended up doing a lot more. The Constituent Assembly was led by three parties because the NACTA could not get a majority. So from the very beginning, the Constituent Assembly represented and, 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 and encapsulated and institutionalized the notion of a consensus-based government in which everybody had to agree and everybody had to be more or less happy or more or less unhappy. Um, and those years were difficult years, and it led to another election uh, in 2015, after the constitution had been passed, and the government was then, that was then led by Nidat Tunis and uh, secular leaders. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, uh, the basis for consensus continued into the next government, 2015-2016. And that, you can say, is a tremendous accomplishment, which it is. Um, each side in this arrangement understood that it couldn't impose, let's say, put it in kind of rational choice theory terms, its first order preferences on the other side. They had to compromise. And democratic institutions, democratic rules were the vehicle of compromise. Um, they were adopted and adapted for purposes of creating a kind of political ceasefire, I like to call it, because it really didn't mean that necessarily there was a fundamental shift in the sort of long-term perspectives of all these parties, but they were agreed to rules which required that they subordinate those preferences to a democratic game. And that's the minimal we need to see in a democratic transition. And as I said before, the head of Ennahda, the Islamist party, Ronushi really appreciated, or came to appreciate, the need to address those who, who feared they had most to lose from democracy. And he, in so doing, uh, agreed to a lot of very significant concessions, including uh, the passing of a law that essentially allowed businessmen who were accused of corruption back into the political system, elements from the old regime who came back. Implicitly, he agreed really not to, uh, to, to mess with the security apparatus. It was a, a very uh, interesting and telling set of uh, uh, concessions because Ganushi really feared one thing. Each side fears, in fact, and that is political exclusion. And so in order to demonstrate that uh, he wouldn't exclude others, but also not to create a pretext for his exclusion, because everybody always had one eye in Egypt, right? Um, <laughs> Renouchi made these, made these concessions. And that's a classic in the literature referred to this as pacted dem democracy, democracy with, uh, uh, with guarantees, uh, because it's one in which democracy and democratic rules are being used as a kind of mechanism of conflict management. I like to think about it in that term. Uh, that over time is meant to create the foundation for a deeper consolidated transition to democracy. But here's the rub, here's the problem that we're living with now in Tunisia, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and that is um, the process of consolidation in a pacted democracy really revolves around finding ways to un unpack the pacted democracy and to make sure that the agreements, the concessions, 
that were um, produced that were necessary to make the transition in the first place don't come and kill the patient, that they don't come back to haunt the transition by creating so many obstacles to consolidation that you never get beyond the initial tra transition or transaction to begin with. And so for my money, after looking at a lot of the definitions of democratic consolidation, I sort of, as many of us do in the business, invented my own, <laughs> because I really feel that in this particular context, what is needed to talk about consolidation are a, a range of steps, commitments, uh, and changes that really make sure that the that the things that were done in order to get the negotiated transition in the first place don't come back and undermine the democracy in the long run. So if you've got, for example, you made a concession to the security apparatus and they really haven't been reformed, you've got to find a way to sort of reform the security apparatus. If the old judiciary comes back, you have to reform the judiciary. If you made, as they did in uh, Tunisia, a certain a set of compromises about the issue of national identity. Is, is, is Tunisia a, a civic state or is it an Islamic is a country based on Islamic tradition or law? And you come up with uh, articles in the current constitution which are really meant to satisfy both, both perspectives simultaneously. You really don't resolve the issue. You can't resolve the issue. And so the whole question of Tunisian identity is left on the table. It's not resolved. It's sort of put aside. Um, and that is another challenge that has to be sort of looked at. You can have a democracy without Democrats, to use the terminology from the literature, but eventually you need Democrats, <laughs> and you do need some sort of, uh, not consensus in the sense that we're talking about it now, but some shared notion of what democracy means on a deeper level, not only as a means, but an, an end, a shared end in and of itself. And so the whole challenge for a democratic transition is to make sure that that the operation doesn't kill the patient, even if the initial operation was a success. And this is the thing that Tunisia has been struggling with ever since 2015, 2016, because in the, uh, 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 in the government that was put together in 2014, 2015, that was shared between Midat Tunis and, and, and Nakhden and a few other parties, there was a certain gentleman's agreement that neither side would really uh, interfere with or impose its, its, its ultimate uh, preferences on the other. And what this translated into in practical terms was not only an avoidance of a lot of the basic issues around, uh, let's say, national identity, that translated, for example, I'll give you the, 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 the institutional implications of this sort of gentleman's agreement, the, the, the new constitution that was passed in 2014 established that for the first time, and this was a first in the Arab world, there would be a Supreme Court that had the right to, right to judicial review. Quite remarkable. Um, I mean, typically speaking, and I don't, meant to be, don't mean to beat up too much on good old Egypt, but you know, the Supreme Court there has really been an ally of the regime and the military. This idea was to create a, a Supreme Court that was really independent and represented uh, the rule of, no, of law, uh, not the rule by law, but the rule of law. Um, those are different things, aren't they? And so, um, uh, but nobody could agree on this. And, and typically, one of the worst heritages, with all due respect to my French friends, is this legacy of French law. There are so many courts and so many judges and so many lawyers in the political elite and so many procedures for every decision that when it came time to create the Supreme Court, it just, the procedural aspects plus the identity issues really prevented the appointment of a Supreme Court. Um, and so that issue was, you know, basically uh, not resolved. And even the Truth and Dignity Commission, that was, you know, this was another first for Tunisia, which really has allowed for a creative process by which people, uh, leaders in, from the security sector who had abused the rights of the citizens who were invited to testify as well as victims, really had limited success because, in point of fact, many of the issues that were at the heart of uh, the Ben Ali era, era, especially having to do with rape of women, were not touched by this com committee in order to not antagonize secular forces. So you think about all the agenda items that are left, and I'm just talking about the, uh, 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 the, uh, the identity item. Consider the big, big item, which is the economic issue, because the legacy of Bourguiba and Ben Ali is a state that was highly interventionist. And it was supported in its policies by the Juge de Tete, the, the very large, powerful labor union. Uh, and so from 2015 to 2017, 
and I won't get into details because it's not a, it's not a, there are ups and downs in terms of the process of economic reform. But by and large, both sides in this, in this, in this, in this uh, marriage of convenience, if you like, don't really want to promote any uh, significant changes in the uh, economic arena and to advance or impose the kinds of market-oriented economic reforms demanded or expected by the IMF because they do not want to antagonize the UGDT and they want the other guy to go first. Well, you, know, you, go, you, know, you can lose your shirt, like you can, yeah, but I'm not. So both sides agree to basically do nothing and we reach a situation now, I've just got details here, but I'm not going to read from it. It's a recent report by Isaac Diwan, who's really very knowledgeable about a, a disastrous economic situation. Tunisia is on the precipice of economic collapse. It is a very severe economic crisis in almost every dimension. It's a very profound crisis. And that is a consequence, too, of, uh, of this consensus. So, so why am I dwelling on this? Well. A consensus government in which the parties really don't want to do anything, in which they really agree to disagree, in which there's, there is continuing suspicions, which eventually led, by the way, to a breakup of the power sharing arrangement that had defined in 2018, it really fell apart formally, and it was declared uh, dead and gone. Uh, but a government like that, that is really not able or willing to address these challenges, that is not able or willing to make the hard kinds of decisions is one that's going to, of course, uh, be viewed as ineffective and irrelevant. And this is the story of this recent election. Uh, and what has happened, while well, the first round of it was, of course, the first round of presidential elections in which essentially two c different kinds of advocates of different but related forms of populism, Kais Saeed and Nabil Karoui, uh, uh, are supposed to face off in a second round, but Nabil Karoui is in prison, accused of uh, 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 money laundering, and, uh, and couldn't run, although his wife effectively ran for him, and he came in second. But he is a, uh, he's the Berlusconi of uh, Tunisia. I met with him several times when I was there, and he's very slick. He managed, he brought convoys of doctors and dentists and, 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 and hospital equipment into these rural areas in the west of Western poor part of Tunisia, which is really a different Tunisia from the urban uh, sectors, uh, uh, modernized sectors, and he befriended lots of Tunisians out there and became sort of a hero. So even while he sits in prison accused of uh, money laundering, he was able to come in second in the, in the presidential election. And then Kais Saeed, this very interesting professor of constitutional law who espouses a kind of neo Qaddafiist uh, vision of spontaneous people's action for, on, in the, in, uh, on the local level that is supposed to replace and trump the formal political institutions, including the political parties in parliament. And these, uh, you know, uh, and who is this kind of a, in a kind of a social Islamic conservative? Um, uh, it's not, not somebody who has much of a paper trail, but flying out here, I read a good thirty or forty articles about him, mostly from the French press and including interviews he had on TV. And by the time I landed, I was pretty, I was pretty upset <laughs> because I knew him a little bit when I was in Tunis. And, his, and it's interesting, the students think, oh my god, we thought we knew him, but look what he's saying now. And he has this kind of voluntarist kind of view of spontaneous people's action. And it has no reality. It has no connection to reality. And it, and it also denies what Tunisia is, which is a highly pluralistic country where people have different definitions of political community and authority. And he says these divisions are imposed by the West. They're fostered by the West, that if left to their own devices, Tunis Tunisians would spontaneously realize their shared identity. I mean, he quotes Rousseau all the time, la volonté générale, uh, le peuple, whatever that means. The people is shop, right, in Arabic. <laughs> so it's kind of disconcerting because, and it's really strange because he's a strict constitutionalist. And if you ask me how to put that picture together, I can't, I don't know. You know, he doesn't answer the question. So, so that's the first round. And then, of course, we had the, this, this late, the, the first round of elections, which are really interesting because uh, the key fact to keep in mind is that in many respects what the elections have done is punished almost all the existing secular parties, the, the formal parties that had existed uh, over the last few years. Uh, uh, allowed Enakta to bring in 40, well, this is, says 46, it may be a little fewer maybe a few more, a few less, on the one hand, uh, and, and, and then 
of course, allow uh, the Count of Tunis, uh, which is um, the heart of Tunis, to get 43. In other words, this kind of polarization, this is Nabil Karoui's party. We're here in the green, and, and not the, in, in the blue. I'm glad they haven't given, given us the usual Orientalist coloring, right? So, um, but, you know, neither one will have a majority. And so they're going to have to, and this is, a, this is a political system which has, it has 1,500 lists, 15,000 candidates for 217 seats, 3% threshold, and so what do you get? Simultaneously, enormous fragmentation, and, and at the same time, and this is what is interesting, of course, polarization. Because no, there, neither side, and Anakta has already said they're not going to make a, an alliance with, uh, 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 with uh, the heart of Tunis. And Karoui's party, he's corrupt, he's in prison, we don't want to talk to him. He said the same thing to them. Um, Karama is a kind of Islamist party uh, that is, may have, our, in fact, 20 seats, and already said it's going to ally with Anakta. It's not inconceivable that if Anakta finds enough allies among the various obscure list parties, that it might be able to put together the 109 seats it needs uh, in order to have an alliance. Um, I think, you know, in some sense, it's time to kind of grow up for Tunisia, if you can, and have a government which has a majority and a minority. And the politics of consensus is not going to get you very far. Uh, and this, of course, is what Anakta has been trying to get. But, it does, but the, the roadmap is not obvious for doing this. The roadmap is not obvious to do this. And if Anakta tries to create a coalition that it basically excludes the, well, obviously it will exclude the heart of the, the, the Tunis, the, the, Nabil Karoui's party will be excluded, but other secular parties, which are very weak, and lean on independence and the more Islamist-oriented <coughs> parties, uh, while it will have a majority, it will come back to the old problem of fear of democratic exclusion and polarization. So none of the options are particularly good, and um, I'm guessing that in the next round of presidential elections in a week, week and a half, Kais uh, uh, Saeed will win, that's my guess. Um, uh, and um, who knows what kind of president he will make, given his ideo strange ideological orientations, or how and what ways. Anakta has already endorsed him, by the way. Anakta has endorsed him. And clearly, they're hoping for an alliance with the, the president, who, according to the Constitution, has a bit like the French system. He has uh, uh, power in terms of national security, foreign policy, but doesn't deal with domestic issues. Uh, but nevertheless, a kind of a, 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 an alliance between a president like that and a party that of, of, of an alliance of parties that are um, uh, more or less inclined to a kind of Islamist position might create, although I don't think it's going to be easy to do so, a government with a majority and also one in which the other parties will feel profoundly fearful of the outcome. Uh, and then, of course, the impetus might be, who knows, Ganushi, who was, a, who was a, an advocate of consensus government, as I said before, the leader of the Nakba party, Ganushi, may turn around and say, well, May let's bygones be bygones and see if we can create a wider government. Every time I look at this roadmap, and I put this on Facebook the other day to the consternation of some of my friends at Tunis, I said, I'm looking at Tunisia and looking at Israel. You know, it seems to me so similar in some ways to the kind of fragmented nature of Israeli politics, in which it's so difficult to produce a clear uh, majority. But in the case of Tunisia, the stakes are very high because it's not a consolidated democracy, and the struggle to create a viable government under conditions of very severe economic crisis uh, and repolarization accompanied by fragmentation uh, it may lead to a worsening of our already very bad economic situation and then some sort of economic or social explosion, uh, the likes of which it's, it's hard to, uh, to imagine. In the case of Tunisia, a, friend, a good friend of mine is in Paris once had the following insight. He said to me, uh, how does Tunisia fall apart? And I didn't have a good answer, mm -hmm. because it's not clear how it falls apart. I mean, there isn't a military to go to to solve your problem, and that's, thank God, there's no military like that. But uh, when you think about the fact that Tunisia has, has an open border, pretty much, <laughs> with, with Libya, and a nearly open border with Algeria, when you think about the fact that ISIS has set up training camps in Libya, and has periodically tried to cross over the border to undertake attacks, it's amazing that the security situation isn't a lot worse to begin with um, because of this uh, uh, pure geography and a collapsed state as one, uh, on one of the borders. 
and so this is not a time to have a divided government. This is not the time to have a, a struggle over, which could last weeks or months, uh, over, uh, over forming a, a stable government. It is, you need precisely the opposite. And what the electoral system is doing is replicating, even if we recognize that, look, the so-called secular parties were never political parties. The only actual political party that operated in all these years as a party was an act. Uh, Need that tune was always a, per a personalistic party dr r ridden by personalistic and family divisions. Um, when you speak to people who work with NDI and IRI, the National Democratic Institute and the Republican Institute, they talk about training sessions for elections. The secular parties never show up. They arrive late. They don't take them seriously. But a lot of folks are disciplined. They take politics seriously. They're a party. They're a real party. Um, um, and they have managed to survive, and obviously they're, they're, they have increasingly lost more and more of the electorate over, over the past years, but they've come up still intact as an existing political party. Uh, and so you're going to see a, a real a struggle for Anakta to find ways to actually uh, rule. And the interesting thing I'll close here is that Honushi, the head of Anakta party, ran for the uh, parliamentary elections. And it's not inconceivable that he could emerge as prime minister. Uh, this was a, quite a change because Anakta had always tried to sort of not overplay its hand and not, um, and, 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 and the fact that it had a secular president was, 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 and a secular prime minister was good for it. It allowed it to, to work on, on the ground, on mobilization, and not elevate politics to the point where it had a prime minister who might threaten or seem to threaten the secular parties. And now Ghanoushi could emerge as a prime minister. So the whole game has changed in some respects and hasn't changed in others. It's, you know, it's on one level plus ça change, but in a much more kind of divided, fragmented arena. And as I said before, the context, I meant, I, I had planned to end on a somewhat more optimistic note. I don't know how I, I'm not sure where to go with that. <laughs> but, but, um, but there it is, where, you know, it's a very, it's gonna be a very difficult and dangerous moment. And when you consider that, when I talk to security people there, I'm always amazed that the security situation is as good as it is. The United States has invested a lot of money and equipment helping the security forces reassert control uh, uh, along the borders within the main cities. The borders, of course, are constantly areas of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of attacks, periodic attacks coming across the border. But they've done a good job of that. But one or two small, major attacks, we had one in Tunis a, a month and a half ago, just a week after my students left. Thank God. Um, uh, you know, one or two, one more or two attacks in, 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 along the beach areas and so on could really just send tourism, which has come back a little bit, just back down to, to you know near zero. So it's a precarious situation. So one can say, in conclusion, that Tunisia had a very successful transition, <laughs> uh, and, but the transition has left a legacy of costs that and tied a kind of Gordian knot that nobody knows what to do with now. And we can see it in the, both the presidential election and the parliamentary election. And we really have to keep our fingers crossed that leaders such as Ghanoushi himself and others will be able to stand up there and resist, particularly if Kais Saeed becomes president, uh, the kind of utopian notions of politics he's throwing around and really focus on the kinds of uh, tough decisions that need to be made in order for Tunisia to, to, to face the economic crisis. It faces. So I'll leave it there and uh, welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan.